Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope everyone had a good coffee break. Um, who actually drank coffee and who actually had beer? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's BrewCon. Uh, thank you once again to the BrewCon organizers and volunteers for putting on this event. This is one of my favorite security events, so it's always a pleasure to be able to contribute to uh, another excellent BrewCon. So thank you for showing up, and thank you very much to the BrewCon crew for having me. So today, we're going to talk about something that I've been doing a lot of research for in my own organization, but uh, I'm going to present a more personal perspective on things. So today, I'm representing myself, as opposed to representing an employer, to talk about a typhoon in a teacup, evaluating reporting on high-profile threats. Uh, disclaimer, uh, that the following commentary represents my own uh, personal reflections on the associated topics and is not associated with any employer or other organization. We're just going to talk shop today uh, to see where things go and explore what I think are some interesting tensions when it comes to cyber threat intelligence and cyber threat intelligence information sharing and information dissemination and what that means when it comes to dealing with some complex and potentially very concerning threats. So first, our agenda. Uh, we'll talk a bit of background on an adversary that has been labeled Volt Typhoon by Microsoft and that Labeling has been consistent across various other reporting entities. It's not a threat actor that's of particular concern, or at least doesn't appear to be so for European entities at this point in time. So I thought this would be an interesting discussion for those not familiar of what's going on elsewhere in the world and maybe uh, inform uh, individuals for what's going on elsewhere. But it's a good case study to lead up into what I call the defender's dilemma when it comes to allocating scarce resources for defensive decision making and defensive vectoring in order to counter potential adversaries. We'll then discuss information sharing and disclosure and how this relates to that defender's dilemma and then get into what decisions we can make with respect to information in um, less than ideal circumstances and uh, without unlimited resources and talk about the lessons and implications behind this case study. So first, Volt Typhoon. Let us introduce our actor or our, uh, the star of the show. It's not me, it's Volt Typhoon. Um, so other than playing around with generative AI, uh, what is Volt Typhoon? So like I said, Volt Typhoon is a threat actor that has been uh, pretty top of mind, top of the headlines in the US and in the Anglo ecosystem, especially if you're in Australia, because Volt Typhoon is a People's Republic of China-linked threat actor that appears to have been active since at least 2021. Uh, I suspect that this actor has been active, has been operating prior to that, but as far as publicly available information uh, from Microsoft, from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, in the United States, 2021 seems to be the good baseline for this threat actor. Uh, but what's important about this threat actor is that they appear to be very laser-like focused on critical infrastructure entities. So electric utilities, water utilities, logistics organizations in the United States as well as elsewhere um, with the assessment that this activity is pre-positioning for future disruptive events um, keyed to a potential Taiwan invasion or a U.S. intervention should the People's Republic of China invade Taiwan uh, or take some other action that Volt Typhoon will step in to disrupt, disable, or otherwise make more difficult any efforts by the U.S. and potentially allies to come to the assistance of Taiwan. So very interesting stuff. Uh, lots of interesting geopolitical context around this. We're going to ignore all that uh, because that's not what we're here for today. It's Brucon. Um, but you know, if you want to map this out in terms of threat intelligence, so classic diamond model mapping, for those of you who are familiar with the diamond model of intrusion analysis, that we have an adversary that is linked to the People's Republic of China, but notably not linked to any specific entity um, in China. So we don't know if this is strategic support force, uh, Ministry of State Security, or other you know, specific entities. We just know that it exists and appears to be a, and is aligned with Chinese strategic interests and operations. But more interestingly, on a technical level, Volt Typhoon operates in a way that is very annoying, um, to put it mildly. They specialize in and focus on operating primarily through living off the land techniques and uh, based upon available reporting and incident analysis, do a very 
good, uh, very thorough job of blending in with legitimate administrator and uh, network uh, operator activity. So there are some cases where we see somewhat unique tools associated with this entity's use, but nothing that stands out like this is a malware family uniquely associated with this adversary, which makes identifying them, attributing them, and finding them very difficult, uh, which becomes even more frustrating when we look at the network infrastructure associated with this threat actor's operations, that they leverage botnets of proxied infrastructure compromising small office, home office routers and, switch and uh, other network devices to proxy network traffic between Volt Typhoon operators and their ultimate victims, thus making things like classic indicators of compromise that when it comes to command and control infrastructure effectively useless uh, because the infrastructure in question is all you know, potentially your home router, uh, your, your home network device. Victimology is, like I said earlier, primarily U.S., U.S.-based or U.S. territory-based uh, critical infrastructure, but there are signs of potential targeting elsewhere, including Australia, New Zealand. There's been some reporting on activity in Africa, but I question that uh, given I don't know why that would happen and there doesn't seem to be much strong motivation for doing so, but it is possible and it has been reported by other entities that there has been Volta Typhoon activity identified in African countries. The initial reporting around Volt Typhoon centered around first a Microsoft blog, which was probably handheld a little bit by other entities to get to publication, um, that detailed how this entity operates from a very, uh, again, living off the land centric perspective, and then followed up shortly thereafter by reporting from US government entities given the perceived gravity and seriousness of this threat actor. But what's important is that it's not just what was technically reported, what's really important is what did the media say? Uh, and if we look at what uh, English language news uh, reported on with respect to this, we see things like China's cyber army is invading critical U.S. services, or China hacks U.S. critical networks in Guam, raising cyber war fears. Um, so the hype train started fairly early and fairly significantly with respect to this threat actor. Uh, not without reason, because again, we have an entity that based upon communications coming from very senior people involved in uh, North American cybersecurity operations like Jen Easterly, um, I'm missing names right now, but others that were involved in CISA, uh, General Nakasone, the former head of the National Security Agency, have all identified this actor as being uniquely interesting and uniquely concerning when it comes to not just cybersecurity, but the security of critical infrastructure such as the electric grid, wa water and wastewater treatment, and similar items. Uh, because the victims in question are very interesting uh, when we uh, look to Volt Typhoon operations. So we've had publicly reported critical infrastructure entities on the island of Guam, which serves as sort of a uh, island forward defense outpost or whatever for the U.S. military when it comes to uh, being able to in, uh, get involved with uh, enti uh, operations in the Eastern Pacific. But also critical infrastructure entities in Hawaii, ports and logistics facilities within the continental United States, uh, critical infrastructure facilities associated with or linked to military installations, again, in the United States, Inter internet service providers and managed service providers either as a primary target or as a means to try to get at follow-on targets within these environments. And then also, somewhat concerningly, smaller utilities like municipalities and cooperatives uh, in North America that really don't have the resources that you would associate with you know, a very large organization in terms of security resources and looking for ways to gather information and develop persistent access to these entities as well. So overall, looking at a threat actor that doesn't appear to be engaged in operations that you would associate with persistent information collection and espionage, but rather and more worryingly, developing points of presence and building the profile necessary to potentially engage in disruptive operations against critical infrastructure in the future. Concerning. In terms of the intrusion methodology associated with Volt Typhoon, and this is where we, you know, we've had background, now we get to the you know, bits that are most, most relevant, Volt Typhoon operates in a way that's not especially unique, but doing so to a degree and extent that makes them 
especially difficult to track, identify, and counter because first we have this use of proxy networks of compromised systems for initial access and command and control. So both the command and control nodes as well as the sort of like firing nodes when it comes to launching exploits, both plus one days as well as some zero day use uh, are coming from network infrastructure that wouldn't be easily associated with uh, threat actor activity. So that part of the equation uh, is difficult. Then we have an emphasis once the Volt Typhoon has access to victim environments of credential capture, dumping them from compromised systems, trying to get domain admin access and dumping ntds.dit and similar items to gather as many credentials as possible, especially privileged credentials within the victim environment and to reuse these captured credentials both for persistent access to the victim environment as well as lateral movement within them. And finally, doing all of this without resorting to any sort of unique tooling, uh, or even for that matter, much in the way of commodity tooling. So Volt Typhoon operations have been associated with use of tools such as Mimikatz, a proxying tool called Fast Reverse Proxy, which is publicly available, and some other items, but there is no unique malware, or even the use of tools like Cobalt Strike, where you would see a unique configuration value expressed as part of its use. So effectively blending in very effectively with network operations and hiding within the noise, so to speak, of legitimate administrator activity, and even timing the use of credentials based upon Volt Typhoon's persistent access and reviewing of logging information in victim environments to try to only use credentials when they normally appear to be in use within the victim ecosystem. So pretty interesting stuff in terms of operational security and similar. Uh, I think the command and control infrastructure aspect of Volt Typhoon is very interesting and unique. So there's been excellent reporting by the telecommunications company Lumen and their Black Lotus laboratory on some of the botnets associated with Volt Typhoon command and control infrastructure. Interestingly enough, that command and control infrastructure was also taken down by the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation last year as part of a counter operation. And we saw just yesterday, uh, I didn't have time to update my slides because beer, um, <laughs> that a additional proxy networks associated with PRC link threat actors were also identified and disrupted by US entities. So this is very much an active game because Lumen also reported on another um, campaign of compromising Versa Director external facing servers as part of reestablishing some of the botnets associated with and linked to Volt Typhoon activity. So very much an interesting game of con persistent uh, attempts to weaponize the neutral web. Separate topic, something I'm researching on actually. You may get to read a paper on this in the future if you so desire. Um, but really emphasizing, and similar to what I talked about at BrewCon last year in the Vulcan files, of utilizing the compromise of uh, intermediary neutral infrastructure and weaponizing that for, for use in campaigns both as platforms to launch scanning and exploitation activity from as well as to proxy communications between the actual adversary and victim environments. So interesting stuff. I recommend reading up on this if you have the opportunity to do so. The impacts of Volt Typhoon are indeterminate. There is no known disruption, destructive activity, et cetera, that is linked to Volt Typhoon operations. They have just broken into networks and kind of sat there gathering information, which on the one hand is good. We've not seen disruptive operations. On the other hand, it's worrying. Why the hell are they there? What are they waiting for? So to date, there have been no publicly known or acknowledged impact resulting from Volt Typhoon activity, except perhaps lots of busy and frustrated analysts that are chasing after these assholes to try to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, so with that in mind, we've defined an adversary. How does this adversary look in terms of popular or reasonably popular, we're not exactly in a popular field, I suppose, uh, discourse? Well, there's been continued hype. So for example, at the RSA conference in San Francisco last year, there were individuals from various US government agencies that were giving interviews and doing a panel discussion. And CISA Executive Director Brandon Wales said that any um, perceived or estimate of likely Volt Typhoon operations is likely an underestimate. That's quite the thing to say. Um, 
presumably that information or that statement is coming with some evidence that cannot be shared publicly, uh, but definitely goes to highlight that there is a level of seriousness and potentially concern around these operations that, oh yeah, anything that you see around this, take that number of intrusions and double it for what's likely uh, realistic. That's concerning. And then we saw further um, discussion around this, around the Black Hat and DEF CON conferences in Las Vegas just a few weeks ago, which prompted me submitting this discussion to Brucon as part of their untapped uh, call for papers, that the uh, a quote from Alex Stamos, who is pretty famous in information security circles, that the Chinese would love to be that successful on day one of the invasion of Taiwan, of disrupting the ability of the United States to respond to an invasion. Uh, with the follow-on quote that I think we got a bit of a dress rehearsal on what the start of World War III would look like. That's a little inflammatory. If we're going to say things like this, presumably this should be about a fairly important, significant, and concerning actor, and based upon what's been shared at least, it appears that Volt Typhoon fits that bill, yet we have a hard time of trying to really identify what's going on based upon the nature of how this adversary operates and the lack of information about actual intrusions beyond things that have been leaked or selectively leaked to media outlets. So despite concerns, the publicly available information on Volt Typhoon activity remains pretty scarce. There's a grand total, so Lumen has three blog posts about botnet activity associated with the command and control activity for Volt Typhoon. There's the original Microsoft blog about Volt Typhoon activity, something published by the firm SecureWorks on what they call Bronze Tempest, uh, or bronze something, I actually might be messing that up right now, uh, that relates to this activity, and then two reports from CISA. That's it for what is assessed and publicly acknowledged to be the greatest threat to uh, US-related, at least, um, cyber operations, which, again, from a European perspective, I think this is an interesting case study for, like, well, if this is such a big deal, why aren't we seeing more? Why hasn't there been more shared? Because I can tell you from a certain degree of authority that there really isn't much else out there that has been shared out in public or at least shareable circles on this entity, which leads us to the defender's dilemma. So Volt Typhoon is a very concerning entity. I think based upon the people who are saying things and what they're saying, I don't suspect that anyone is lying, and I'm not trying to imply that uh, officials at organizations such as CISA and elsewhere, including ASD, NCSC, and elsewhere, looking to entities like Australia and the United Kingdom, are trying to blow this out of proportion either. But it's important to note that Volt Typhoon is yet to result in any sort of known impact or effect. So based upon that, what do defenders and decision makers do? Uh, who here has unlimited resources for their security budget? Exactly. Um, when it comes to things that are notional threats or that are longer term, less able to be oriented to something like a business disruption, how do we deal with this when it comes to vectoring resources, assets, people to deal with it? Because the thing is that defensive resources are scarce. No one raised their hand that they have unlimited resources, and if anyone did, I would throw my pointer at them uh, because that, that would be an egregious lie. No one uh, has the, that to apply to their security program. So the result is that we have trade-offs and the need to economize on defense. I can't defend against everything. Uh, to use a classic quote from Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, uh, you know, he who defends everything defends nothing. If we layer our defense so thin across all possible vectors, we place ourselves in an unenviable position where we're opening ourselves up on multiple fronts to potential intrusion. So defense will typically be oriented to the most likely and impactful threats that we will face. But what does that mean if we're talking about big, scary geopolitical threat versus the script kiddies sitting in Moscow or in Bulgaria or in the UK, if we're talking scattered spider, uh, that are trying to encrypt our network and extract cryptocurrency from us? Well, the thing is, is that Volt Typhoon operations represent a great and significant strategic risk to the United States and related interests around a Taiwan Strait scenario but thus far have not manifested as an immediate concern to potential victims. Uh, this might be something I need to worry about, but in the current here and now, what's my motivation to try to respond to an entity that doesn't appear to be um, engaged in or about to execute something disruptive in my environment? 
So looking at priorities from a national security perspective, Volt Typhoon represents a high-level strategic risk relative to a conflict with the People's Republic of China. That is non-trivial, serious, and frankly kind of scary, uh, whether you are residing in Belgium, the US, Vietnam, or elsewhere, that this touches on some pretty serious stuff. But from an individual asset owner perspective, what am I most worried about? Like, I'm most worried about the ransomware, the BEC entity that's trying to hurt me right now and vectoring resources appropriately to try to counter that threat that is very immediate and very latent uh, in my ecosystem. So we see a tension in priorities between what makes sense for the overall environment versus what makes sense for the individual entity that's trying to defend themselves. Uh, because again, we don't have unlimited resources and things that we spend chasing for Volt Typhoon in our network are resources not spent trying to lock down and harden our environment uh, in order to prevent the scattered spider or the lock bit or take your pick of various ransomware ecosystem entities to uh, affect our ecosystem. So does the security team invest untold hours and resources chasing a very hard to identify actor like a Volt Typhoon based upon their operational profile or do they spend that time hardening their network against ransomware activity? This is an open question, because I don't have a good answer for it. Sorry, I ask hard questions that really don't have good, easy answers to them, because uh, most of what we deal with in security, because the reason we have good jobs, is because we're dealing with hard questions with no easy answers. And there is no easy answer to this right now, uh, because again, there's that tension between what helps my immediate defensive posture versus what is necessary to defend whole of country, whole of government, uh, whole of continent um, security when it comes to potential impacts to critical national infrastructure. Which gets us to information sharing and disclosure. So one of the problems with Volt Typhoon is that we don't have that much information. Uh, again, five, six reports that are out there uh, detailing this most concerning threat actor. And while some parts of those reports get into pretty close levels of detail. Others are just like Volt Typhoon uses uh, living off the land techniques and uh, leverages volume shadow copies in order to extract the NTDS uh, database from domain controllers to then harvest passwords offline. Like, okay, so get in line with how many other adversaries that do the exact same damn thing. Um, and how they're doing it blends in very effectively, not just with administrator operations, but also a number of other threat actors. So one possibility is what if everything is secret? What if all the research, the analysis, and a lot of the in-depth understanding of what a Volt Typhoon does or is capable of is happening in a vault uh, behind a very, very thick door with a combination lock on it uh, by people who are operating on a network that's not connected to the internet effectively? That's a possibility. So some, or at least a lot of Volt Typhoon risk and some of the activity is a matter of public record. We've seen reports from industry, we've seen reports from government entities. We'll likely see continued reporting from uh, other entities moving forward as this remains an item of concern. But the precise risk of this entity beyond some things that have been leaked to the media like Guam and Hawaii and so forth, um, are largely unreported. We don't really know very effectively of like, okay, we've seen the use of plus one days and so forth for exploitation, but is there specific pieces of infrastructure that this threat actor targets? Are there specific relationships with geographic relationships or strategic uh, value to the targets that Volt Typhoon is pursuing, or are they opportunistic in their targeting based upon whatever they can get access to? And we have to ask ourselves is that what if these information gaps, this lack of disclosure, is a matter of how that information has been gathered? So earlier this year, I had the opportunity to present and attend the first CTI conference. Uh, there I gave a presentation on the disclosure dilemma in ensuring defense. Uh, trust me, this is not a Rickroll, so you can snap this uh, QR code if you want to watch that talk, or you could look at the link at the end of the presentation, which I, has been shared with the organizers, and I will push to SlideShare later. Um, I will briefly uh, get into that discussion, because that's a longer discussion on its own, uh, but the idea being is that ultimately intelligence supports decisions. Impactful decisions result in actions. So as a defender, I'm looking to intelligence to inform me what our adversary is doing so I can take some definitive action in my environment to have an impact of some sort. But the thing is, is that once I as a defender have leveraged intelligence to have some impact and improve my defensive posture, any adversary that's not incompetent will notice that. 
impacts alert adversaries. Why is my C2 network no longer reachable? Why have I been evicted from this network? Why have all the passwords within this organization been rolled over across the entire domain? That is a sign to the adversary that, shit, I've been caught. Acting on intelligence thus informs adversaries of discovery, forming a natural tension between the continued ability to gather intelligence and information about an adversary versus acting on that intelligence to evict that adversary. Doing so will compromise or potentially compromise our ability to perform the former. So significant information may very well exist about Volt Typhoon or similar entities, like we could talk about an APT-29 or an APT-28 or a sandworm or similar, but sharing this information, especially prior to an impact has been registered, may risk our ability to continuously collect information and surveil that adversary to allow us to make decisions in the shadows or on the side of events as they're taking place. So what, what we see here is a very delicate balancing act where complete visibility into Volt Typhoon activity or sharing complete visibility on Volt Typhoon activity to decision makers may risk continued visibility into that adversary uh, and its operations. We lose sight of what's happening and the ability to then leverage that visibility when it really matters. But limited disclosure to preserve access and the methods that are used to uh, maintain that access limits defenders' responses and affects defender prioritization. Like, well, if you can't share any more information on this and I don't see any immediate value, then why am I bothering trying to defend against this when I know that Lockbit, Akira, or Blackbasta, or whomever is standing right by in the wings waiting to just encrypt my entire network and shut me down for potentially weeks? So figuring this out is pretty key. Uh, and this tension between complete visibility versus limited visibility is very real and has impacts in how we defend against fairly complex and interesting threats. So presumably, uh, I would say definitively, authorities, whether we're talking about the US, the EU, Belgium, et cetera, have a desire to improve critical infrastructure defense. We like it that when we flip the switch, the lights come on. We like it when we turn the taps, the water flows, and that the water won't poison us, and similar items. But the very act of defending critical infrastructure at times may imperil our ability to continuously observe and witness what those who might threaten it uh, attempt to do. So again, that tension between disclosure and continued collection becomes very real. The stakeholders, whether the entities on the spooky, scary intelligence community side of things that have hacked the hackers and similar, uh, to the asset owners that are trying to make sure that their electric cooperative in rural Belgium or something like that uh, continues to operate and service its customers, need to balance defense and intelligence needs. How do I find a happy medium between my ability to continually uh, operate and defend my environment while also ensuring that I have visibility into adversaries so that when things get really nasty or are about to, I have the visibility necessary to act on that. Getting us to making decisions. Making decisions is hard because we have to ask ourselves, as Lenin said, what, what is to be done? But also, we have to ask ourselves, as Lenin would say, life is what happens when you are making other plans. So yes, thank you for getting this joke. Uh, it's a very bad joke, but it's one that I can't help but making. Um, you know, the idea being is that we can't just stand idly by, that things will progress irrespective of our action or inaction, and thus we need to start figuring out how do we respond to events such as this. So entities such as Volt Typhoon or a sandworm or you know, take your pick of a nasty threat actor represent significant concerns. But sharing too much can jeopardize continued visibility into these adversaries such that we then give up the ability to then respond or identify when these adversaries are imminently or about to execute something uniquely disruptive, destructive, or harmful. So, but sharing too little can ruin reputations and lead to a cry wolf situation where I have said so many things about the nasty Volt Typhoon that's going to come in the dark and knock over your network or whatever and steal your car and light your house on fire that uh, this entity or whatever, if they never manifest in terms of some sort of impact, then I start getting sensitized, desensitized to reporting on this item even if they remain important. So circumstances require a balance and a nuance to appropriately address that when we see quotes like what we saw for the hype cycle earlier in this presentation related specifically to Volt Typhoon don't really help matters because they blow things out of proportion. So when looking at things from the strategic context, 
We want to figure out what's our objective. Do we want to defend things at all costs, or do we want to balance our ability to continually analyze this activity uh, and then vector resources to defense in a more immediate sense when it appears that things are about to go down, so to speak? So defense at all costs favors unfettered information sharing, like get it all out there, complete transparency, but will almost certainly result in intelligence loss and limiting our ability to gain insight into this threat actor in the future. Balancing sources and methods is going to reduce our scope for maximal defense, which is a scary thing when you think about how this might impact critical infrastructure sectors like water, power, food, logistics, and similar. And no one wants to be on record saying it's like, yep, we're okay if this entity or whatever gets this far into certain networks because we want to make sure that we have continued visibility in them. That's a scary thing to say and probably would fill a lot of people with a lot of unease. But in doing so, we can at least maintain visibility into that threat actor and not tip them off to certain levels of how they are compromised and thus continue to gather the information necessary to make authoritative decisions at a point of extreme value or extreme risk and concern. So defenders, uh, meanwhile, need to count, prioritize the greatest risks to the organization. Um, oftentimes, that's going to be a lot of e-crime stuff, BEC, ransomware, uh, info stealers, and similar. Identifying long-running, long-term intrusions is hard to do because it's expensive. It's a pain in the ass. Uh, it takes a lot of time from your SOC, your IR, if you have them, your threat hunters, and similar, uh, to try to chase this activity down. So guidance is required from leadership and stakeholders to shift priorities. Why am I going to look into the specter of Volt Typhoon, which may or may not be in my network, when I know right now my house is maybe not burning, but smoldering a little bit because I have ransomware entities and opportunistic exploitation going on against my external facing network assets, phishing going on against my users, cred stealers or whatever that are trying to uh, then sell the information they gather to others on dark web forums so that people can RDP into my network and then hold it for ransom. So there is a communication aspect of this that highlighting a threat, like talking about why Volt Typhoon is so serious, can call attention to concerns. But doing so absent visible impacts or concrete risks, um, risks getting us into that crying wolf situation where I am screaming from the rooftops about how important this is, but absent any actual impact to point to, it seems notional in nature. So stakeholders and those that have access to this information need to be very careful in balancing between awareness of these sorts of threats and hyping them out so that people start tuning them out and not no longer paying attention. Finding some happy medium between the two uh, that stakeholders and asset owners can actually leverage to operate in a more effective defensive posture. So managing latent, emerging, or long-running threats with no immediate or near-term impact is very, very hard. Think about climate change, for example. How well have we as a civilization dealt with climate change? Not very well. Why? Because it's an abstract, sort of long-term removed threat from what it is that we're dealing with. Well, you know, I would say maybe not as abstract. I'm from the US, the Southwest US. It's been a very hot summer. They didn't used to be this hot, so maybe we are seeing some things. But anyway, the idea being is that we're talking about very complex problems that have long time frames associated with them, which compared to something that's very immediate in terms of impact, like my house is on fire right fucking now, that is going to prompt a response because it's very easy to make the connection between, hey, something bad's happening and I need to do something about it, whereas longer running problem sets separate these items across time and distance to make it much more difficult for us to recognize them as well as to justify investing in them. So part of the Volt Typhoon question may be the best course of action for sharing information about this entity is maybe we shouldn't be sharing information about this entity in the way that we have been. Maybe instead of going to Politico or the, uh, the Washington Post and similar and talking about how big of a threat this entity is, maybe keep these sorts of discussions quieter in industry-related circles and trusted channels so that we're not going to the press and hyping this sort of threat out, but communicating quietly and discreetly to those that might be immediately affected of what the problem set may be. It doesn't make for very good conference talks, I'll tell you that right now, but at the same time, it may be much more effective in terms of building a meaningful and actionable defensive posture for the organizations that may be impacted by such activity. 
So what lessons and implications can we derive from this discussion? A fairly abstract discussion, and I apologize again, this is a very US-centric threat, but I think an EU audience can learn a lot from this for your own sakes and how you might be dealing with other problems. So first, national, cybersecurity con national security concerns in cyber are long running and complex. Uh, we're talking about system of system items at this point and not very immediate impacts. But the primary concerns in network defense are immediate in nature. How do I keep the ransomware entity out? How do I keep Sandworm out of my network from uh, you know, wiping all my disks or whatever if I happen to be working in Eastern and Central Europe and so forth? But we need to try to identify a way to bridge these two, and doing so is difficult and challenging. Uh, because again, perspectives and, excuse me, motivations are misaligned between the two. So in looking at this, we have conflicting concerns between individual security priorities and national strategic interests. And looking at these, while they don't necessarily have to be in conflict, we find oftentimes that investing in one means taking away from the resources that can address the other, thus leading to tension and conflict for why haven't you, electric utility in California or something like that, invested appropriately to kick Volt Typhoon out of your network? Well, I haven't because while that's going on over here and not really impacting me materially, I'm busy trying to figure out how my IT network doesn't get completely ransomed and shut me down for three weeks and bringing regulatory attention on me that then will get my entire leadership fired or sanctioned or fined. So trying to address how those tensions work together is pretty key and recognizing that they exist is important in understanding why this problem matters and why it manifests to begin with. So in addressing these concerns, we can look to things like clear communication of risk and gravity. Let's not try to hype things up, but let's also be very frank about what's going on and build that level of trust that when I say something or when leadership at some government agency or threat intelligence company says something that we can trust that's like, well, if they're saying it's important, even if I don't have all the details, I should probably trust them. But also we want to highlight the overlaps between specific issues and more general concerns. For example, we can emphasize how individual organizations can benefit from taking action in a way that would disadvantage a Volt Typhoon, but that also would work to uh, hinder or to counteract a more traditional adversary as well. So for example, some problem sets like Lalbin defense may benefit organizations in both immediate and strategic contexts. Communicating like, hey, this isn't just about defending yourself against the big, scary, notional threat of a Volt Typhoon. This will also defend you against the Akira, Play, Conti, et cetera, ransomware uh, affiliate or whatever that's trying to get into your network as well. Highlighting these benefits and communicating them appropriately is important. So things like multi-factor authentication, uh, least privilege user accounts, good patching cycles for external facing assets, all of these items are very applicable across multiple security issues and also happen to try to counteract a lot of the common techniques associated with Volt Typhoon operations. So looking for where we can bridge these concerns by finding commonalities between immediate defense and strategic shoring up of infrastructure can be quite key and quite valuable in trying to address this concern. One way of doing this might be by unlocking resources. Hey, critical infrastructure provider that has limited resources to invest in security, we will give you money to go fix this problem. That would be nice. Um, I'm not going to hold my breath on this one. More likely what we're going to see, and I'm using this in a very explicitly European context, is carrying sticks. So who likes NIST2? <laughs> who is dealing with NIST2 right now? Yeah, I like NIST2, but you know, dealing with it, yes. Uh, yes, I am as well, because I have European clients. Um, but looking for things like standards, requirements, and regulation to start stepping in. What's that? Nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to force and uh, push industry forward in a way where it's like, you might not want to do this, and you might not understand or agree why you need to do this, but you're going to have to do this in order to operate. Um, so we've seen this with like PPD-12 and Circea and similar uh, initiatives in the United States. I think NIST-2 is a bit more comprehensive and certainly European-wide, although it's been slow to be taken up uh, and implemented elsewhere because it's not easy. But I think this is more what we're going to see as a result of this tension between strategic interests and immediate defense is that governments will step in and say like, okay, guess what? You have to do this now, otherwise we will find the shit out of you uh, or take some other disciplinary action 
to make you do this. Ultimately, though, we're trying to seek alignment, that complex, long-running threats, whether cyber, climate change, or similar, require aligning long-term and specific or short-term interests to adequately address and combat them. If we can't manage to do this, we're going to set ourselves up for failure, and those long-running, strategic, or uh, not immediately impactful threats, whether a volt typhoon, Russian disinformation affecting elections, climate change, and similar, will be allowed to run unfettered and free, leading to suboptimal outcomes. So with that, um, I think we have some time for questions. Uh, I do have a question screen, but I will also put this up. It's very tiny, so you can maybe screenshot this or whatever, but resources and references linked to the discussion today. So, hi. Thank you very much for your talk, Joe. Yep. Um, Europe has critical infrastructure too, don't we? Yes. Yeah, so like, it might be interesting to do threat hunting for similar kind of patterns of activity other places than the US, right? Very much agree. So uh, this was a very deliberately given presentation because Volt Typhoon has certainly been top of mind for, again, US and Anglosphere entities. But I would say that maybe Volt Typhoon isn't poking around European networks, but someone certainly is. I don't know, but I, I met with Eric Goldstein at CISA headquarters in January in DC, and like, it was an interesting conversation. Thank you very much. My question. Yep not a comment, is if we go back one slide, like the long running problems like the climate change, migration, you yep. know, like, I don't know, we could go on down the line. There's a lot of inequities. How good of a job are we gonna do as a species if we can't communicate about that because we've blown up our infrastructure? Not very well. Um, you know, definitely setting ourselves up for failure and I think one of the highlights for, or one of the takeaways that I would ask the audience to have from this discussion is that communication is key from a CTI perspective, from a threat ops perspective, all the way to a policy perspective, that being able to accurately, succinctly, and effectively communicate the risk proposition and what is entailed by things like, you know, ranging from volt typhoons in critical infrastructure, sandworm is wiping disks in Ukraine, to climate change is going to kill us all in 50 years, I hope not. Um, you know, that, that is necessary, uh, that ability to accurately communicate and uh, acknowledge that these threats exist and what to do about them is an important first step. And a lot of it's not happening right now because we're filtering these messages through conference presentations. Sorry. Uh, I think this is a good one. There's other good ones as well on this topic. Uh, but more importantly, through things like media sound bites, panel discussions, and similar, where the nuance and detail that is necessary to accurately communicate these items gets lost. More questions? Yep. Um, I was just wondering the the. You had a slide with Alex Tamos that said, yeah, we're preparing ourselves for the Third World War. Yep. What's, what's your stance on that? Do you, do you agree with his proposition? Do you agree with his uh, an analysis of the situation? Or do you think, no, you're, you're overreacting here? Um, so I kind of know Alex, and I was very shocked to see that quote because it seemed very unlike him. So I don't know if it was taken out of context or similar, which is not, would not be the first time that a journalist has done so. But it's very much an inflammatory quote. And on its own, I think it is very much an exaggeration. Um, could it be a preview of the start of World War III? Yeah, maybe. Uh, could it be this is just what state-sponsored threat actors do day in, day out, whether we're talking China, the US, the UK, Russia, et cetera? Um, then you know, this might be par for the course for what it means to develop targets for future action uh, without necessarily progressing on to actions on objectives. So there's a lot, again, you know, going back to my earlier statement, a lot of nuance and context gets lost when you capture a 20-word soundbite with an inflammatory tag to World War III. Um, so there's a lot more to be said for that background and how this activity may or may not relate to a future global catastrophe, which is what a World War III would be. Yep. So, like, it's really easy to screw things up in IT. Yep. This is one thing I've learned well. And if you say, like, all right, where, I'm a nation state, where do I want to have an implant? Some place where it's powerful and it's hard to find me, right? Mm -hmm. Well, other people can think like me, too. So then I got another problem, which is I got a bunch of, say, 
analysts with uniforms on, and they got a sort of a run book, and it's like, if this happens, or if this phone rings, or if this pager goes off, paste this iOS into this screen and hit enter, mm -hmm. for example. But now you got another problem, which you don't know how many other people have access on that box. And if they have a similar trigger condition, or there's any kind of overlap in your sort of automated responses, just imagine what happens if you're on a Cisco box, and you take two sets of iOS code, and you paste it in at the same time, right? Yep. And it comes in interleave. There are emergent effects of this, even if all the state actors are behaving in good faith and trying to be responsible, this could get out of hand very quickly. Mm -hmm. I pause it. Yes. That was not a question, that was a comment. That was not a question. That's okay, you're allowed to get away with a comment. Uh, but I agree with the comment that, um, you know, looking for things like, when it comes to certain sets of infrastructure or targets that are uniquely valuable, they're valuable to many people simultaneously. And countering one entity may have unintended or unexpected effects on other entities as well. So it's very much, do we have any Simpsons fans in the room? Okay, got a few. Uh, yeah, so there was one scene, I'd bring it up on my computer, but it's going to take a while or whatever, where Mr. Burns goes into the office or into the doctor's office to get checked out or whatever, and the doctors tell him, and it's like, you are infected with 74 diseases, including seven that are only found in sharks. And he demonstrates this by pushing all these disease stuffies or whatever into a door and showing that, yeah, because everyone's trying to get it at once, no one can get through, so you're still healthy. Like, that may represent exactly where we reside in terms of critical infrastructure defense, that there's so many people that are trying to knock over these devices that no one's able to be terribly effective because, like, they're all working cross-purposes to one another, almost. But we'll see. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I like the approach of NIST, too, but uh, even if there are no standards yet defined, um, I think we need to uh, we need to appraise the levels of quality in each company because um, about critical infrastructure now it's the second or third level delivery company working with the critical infrastructure or military or yeah and if we appraise the level of quality like two factor authentication and stuff like that yeah I think it's not required to discuss with those companies because maybe don't, they don't have the, the back end, the knowledge, the IT stuff mm -hmm. um, to be on the same page with us, to communicate on the same level. Maybe it's scaring them the shit out of their yeah. lives. No, and that's a very good point that the, again, the expertise to understand and to really process a lot of these threats, the, what these threats may mean, what the reality. Like I gave a non-public, uh, unrecorded talk at DEF CON Sky Talks a few years ago of like, okay, everyone talks about taking down the electric grid. Here's what you'd really need to do to make that happen. I'm not gonna get into that right now because this is being recorded and I don't wanna give people ideas, but it's not easy uh, to do so. And thus trying to break, you know, thread the needle between like, we need to communicate these, these threats are real, actual, we need to do something about them. At the same time, we also need to recognize the reality of adversary space and what they can do, and the knowledge necessary to do that translation and to figure out what are the most appropriate actions. Doesn't exist implies that people are stupid, I'm not trying to do that, but certainly the experience and the domain understanding to do so at a fairly large level, whether it's in policy spheres or even within some of the organizations operating this infrastructure, is not as prevalent as I would like it to be, if that makes sense. So. Yep. Do you think the Vault Typhoon messaging coming from the US government is aimed at people like us? Or do you think, kind of like the APT1 report, it's partly aimed at the Chinese government? A little bit of A, a little bit of B. Um, so I would certainly say that it is aimed at us, including a European audience. And again, Volt Typhoon it appears to be a very U.S. U.S. interest-focused event. Um, China's interesting, though, so I wouldn't just sleep on it. Uh, but at the same time, it's also very much raising the flag of saying, like, hey, we see you. Um, stop. Uh, or trying to communicate that, at least, although it doesn't appear that they have uh, at this point in time, based upon what I know about that threat actor. Or to the same point, the audience is the United States Congress trying to get the funding to the critical infrastructure providers which have no money because they're local governments. Yep, uh, and it's not just the US where that's the case, it's the case in Europe as well, where 
Um, you know, when, when it comes to investment in terms of system st stability and reliability, am I investing, you know, from a power sector perspective and making sure that, hey, my lines aren't dripping when it's hot and that they're not faulting or whatever when it's cold, or am I investing in exotic cybersecurity products? I don't know. One has more immediate payoff, the other is a little more notional. How do I balance that out uh, and figure that out? Again, going back to the tension between immediate needs and the longer term, like, more theoretical potential uh, that may exist for disruptive effects. So. Questions here? Okay. Yeah, all the way up there. Oh. Get some exercise. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, we always talk about um, threat actors from like Russia, China, South, um, North Korea, I'm sorry. But what's actually your take on our offensive capabilities towards those countries as well? It exists. Yeah, I, I guess so, but... Yeah, I mean, no other than that, I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, if it didn't exist, I would be upset as a taxpayer. Uh, I, will, I will put it that way. <laughs> but to think that... I, I, there is a assumption and an assessment that, and we've seen this from public comments from people like Kevin Mandy or whatever, where it's like, you know, we see the five I entities or whatever, but they act responsibly, so we don't, you know, worry about reporting on them. Like, that's a really bold statement. I don't know if I would necessarily agree with that per se, uh, but certainly to assume that there is not anything going in the other direction would be very interesting and probably very sheltered as a view. Um, so something's going on. What that something is, I honestly don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions here in the main room? In the second room, there is some questions. Oh. Uh, one more question here. <laughs> <laughs> so, audience takeaway, if we're going to listen to this excellent talk and be educated and go to our day jobs on Monday, what is something, like a question we should be asking or something we should do different on the basis of your talk? On the basis of this talk, I would say that anyone here who's operating from a uh, defender role internal to an organization or even potentially from a third party position, that when it comes to communication from sources on high, whether that be from your threat intelligence commercial provider or whatever that you're paying lots and lots of money for, or it's coming from CERT BE, you know, national CERT, whatever, uh, hold them accountable and don't be afraid to ask questions. When it comes to material like this, the best way to try to get a greater appreciation of like, well, what's actually going on is to try to pester people. And honestly, intelligence analysts, myself included, like it when we get asked questions if we're allowed to answer them because it shows that people are engaged and are trying to get more information out of what has been provided. So when it comes to something like the Volt Typhoon activity, trying to dig in a little bit deeper, it's like, well, that's cool, your report is nice. How does this relate to my organization? How old is this data? Do you see this same activity going on right now? Asking these questions and having these follow-ups, I think, is, really, is key in order to better assess and orient information about long-running and potentially abstract threats to immediate defensive uh, decision-making. Okay. So, any more questions? No? So, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>